It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its body. His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful, great God! His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness. But these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes. It seemed almost of the same colour as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. Everyone seems to know the name Frankenstein, whether it's from reading a book, watching a movie, or seeing a theatrical adaptation. Dr. Victor Frankenstein is the central character in the novel of the same name, sharing billing with the eponymous Frankenstein's monster, a creature created from different parts of the recently deceased, patched together and brought back to life by the good yet experimental doctor. Frankenstein has become a true icon of horror that will last forever, very much in the same vein, if you'll pardon the pun, as that other great classic blood-sucking horror, Dracula, from the inspired pen of Bram Stoker. But how many people know that author's name? or, for that matter, the name of Mary Shelley, Frankenstein's creator. And if, by some remote chance, they do, how many would be able to tell you the amazing story of her life, filled with death, tragedy, love, heartache, and much, much more besides? Mary Shelley's life was as exciting and dramatic as the monster she bestowed upon the world of literature proving that even in this case, fact truly can be stranger than fiction. Mary Shelley was born over 200 years ago on the 30th of August, 1797 in London, England. Although she traveled extensively throughout Europe during her lifetime, she always returned to live in London. In fact, even now, there are still a great many people who have trouble believing that an 18-year-old Mary Shelley can have had the richness of language or the maturity of life to write such an amazing debut novel as Frankenstein, especially as she was, of course, a lady. 
Equally incredible is the fact that she was only 21 when the book was published. However, should you be prepared to enter the dark recesses of Mary Shelley's imagination, you will quickly realize just how much living she managed to pack into a very short space of time. It's very interesting to note that Mary's formative years were set against the backdrop of the Regency, that period of the nation's history that was named after the Prince Regent, who later became King George IV. George IV was the son of King George III, whom history has recorded as being mad. However, with the benefit of hindsight and the advances of modern medicine, we know that the poor man was not suffering from a mental condition at all, but a physical illness called porphyria that presents all the symptoms of madness. Medicine truly was in its most developmental time, and many surgeons and physicians were called in to try and treat the mad king, and their experimentations would have been reported in the newspapers. Nevertheless, nothing worked, and after a number of attacks, the king was removed from power in 1810, and his son took over as Prince Regent until George III's death in 1820, when the prince-in-waiting at last became king. The Regency was one of the most elegant of ages, but led by a wild and dissolute prince, it was also a decadent age, at least for the wealthy. You only have to look around London, the birthplace of Mary Shelley, to witness some of the stunningly beautiful architecture of the period. Cast your eyes over Regent's Park or Regent Street to see the classically inspired mansions with their white painted facades, grand columns, elegant archways with wrought iron balconies and sweeping windows. There are many streets in London dominated by this distinctive style, and it's not only the country's capital city that benefited from Regency elegance. If you travel to the West Country city of Bath, you'll find just as many examples of this fabulous architecture. The Regency period was all about elegance, with a strict order of manners throughout society, even when people were behaving badly. The decadent fashions of the time, dominated by more scantily clad ladies, the fops and the dandies, only survived for a short period. Even the men jumped on the fashion bandwagon, becoming more immaculate in their personal cleanliness, wearing expensive linen shirts with high collars and frilly sleeves, perfectly tied cravats, double-breasted waistcoats, and exquisitely tailored plain dark coats. Women abandoned their corsets to achieve a high-waisted natural look called the Empire Line. An Empire silhouette was created by wearing a high-waisted dress gathered just under the bust with a long, loose skirt which skimmed the body. The word Empire was adopted because it was promoted by the French Emperor Napoleon whose wife Josephine made this a fashion statement all her own. The most famous novelist of the Regency period was, of course, Jane Austen. She was the author of Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, Emma, Mansfield Park, Persuasion, and Northanger Abbey. It is interesting to note how Jane Austen herself reflected this time of change in English history which coincided with the Napoleonic Wars, when Napoleon appointed himself Emperor of France and was continually attempting to gain control of Europe to build his empire even further. Her fine novels paint a remarkable picture of the society in which she lived, leaving a fascinating record of the manners and etiquette a lady or gentleman of this period adhered to. Mary Shelley, writing in a much darker and grittier style, broke down the barriers of constraint 
using her own less conventional tragic life as fuel for her creation, Frankenstein. This was indeed a time of great change. Even Napoleon himself had risen to power on the back of the French Revolution, where the working classes had risen up to overthrow the ruling aristocracy. This remarkable period in world history spawned its own fair share of radicals and free thinkers in Britain as well. Now this is where Mary Shelley's story gets very interesting because her parents were far from being typical of the age in which they lived. The Georgian period that predated the Regency was also dominated by classical elegance and social obedience. But Mary's family background varied dramatically from anything you might find documented in a Jane Austen novel. Their views and actions were very forward-thinking as they constantly battled to break the mold of the strictly rigid status quo. They were both rebellious and outspoken, which is why Mary so obviously followed in their footsteps. In her own words, Mary Shelley described them as persons of distinguished literary celebrity, and their daughter evidently admired them greatly. Mary Shelley's mother was also called Mary, and in her day, the lady in question, Mary Wollstonecraft, was certainly notorious. Born in London in 1759, she left home after her own mother's death to make her way in the world, something that her daughter would also find herself doing. Mary Wollstonecraft was known then, and still is, for being a strong supporter of the rights of women long before the women's liberation movement of the 1960s and 70s stole her thunder. She wrote a famous book called A Vindication of the Rights of Women in 1792, which was contemporary with The Rights of Man, written by Thomas Paine. Paine's highly influential work was written in response to criticism of the French Revolution, and he suggested that everyone should live as equals vindicating the French peasant's attack upon the aristocracy as totally justified. He was labeled an anti-monarchist, labeled an outlaw, and would have been arrested had he not fled to France. In Mary Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Women, she explores a similar theme, but from the perspective of men and women being equals. Mary attacked the way women were denied education and accused the system of being unfairly balanced towards making women entirely dependent upon men. She hated the view of women as weak and passive, which she believed had been created by the society in which she lived, rather than by the men themselves. Mary Wollstonecraft was not anti-men, she was anti-establishment, and she was passionate about equality. Practicing what she preached, Mary set up a school in Newington Green, London, at which she taught with her sister, expressing her views on the upbringing of women. It was not a success and the school was forced to close, so she began writing for a living, translating reviews and articles for radical magazines from French newspapers. Visiting Paris at the time of the French Revolution, she met an American writer called Gilbert Inlay, and the pair embarked on a scandalous, passionate affair that resulted in the birth of her first child, Fanny. Four years later, after becoming depressed by Gilbert's constant unfaithfulness, she returned to London and tried to commit suicide by throwing herself into the River Thames, which runs through the very heart of the city. Today, the majestic river is flanked by the Houses of Parliament, Big Ben, and the Tower of London, and traversed by the world-famous Tower Bridge, where pleasure cruisers take tourists to see the sights. At the time of Mary Wollstonecraft's suicide bid, the Thames was one of the busiest rivers in the world. Fortunately for the world of literature, this constant traffic proved to be her salvation and she was quickly pulled out of the river to live another day. 
Evidently, the water of old Father Thames failed to dilute Mary Wollstonecraft's radical views, and shortly afterwards she came into contact with another radical writer and philosopher, William Godwin. He began life as a minister before turning against religion and preaching against God. He believed that men acted according to reason and that rational beings could live in harmony without laws or institutions. He was a cold, remote man with little time for anything but his philosophical studies. Yet his love for Mary Wollstonecraft overcame his studies and the unconventional couple produced a daughter, Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, who was destined to become our Mary Shelley. However, the new baby was not illegitimate, as Mary and William married here at Old St. Pancras Church on St. Pancras Road before she was born. And Godwin took on Fanny as his legitimate daughter too. This quaint little church has been in existence since somewhere around 300 AD, with sections of it using Roman bricks and tiles. The newlyweds, although committed to each other, continued to lead free, independent lives as they believed was their right. But sadly, with the birth of their daughter in 1797, the very same year of their marriage, the unorthodox relationship was to come to a tragic end. Mary Wollstonecraft was in labor for 18 grueling hours. And Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, later to be the author of Frankenstein, was only able to nestle in the bosom of her mother for a mere 10 days before a nasty infection severed the bond forever. Because of the difficult and unhygienic conditions that were common during childbirth in the late 18th century, it was not uncommon for women to die as a direct result. But in Mary Wollstonecraft's case, it certainly wasn't expected or any easier to deal with. With her newborn namesake a few days away from being two weeks old, Mary Wollstonecraft was buried at St. Pancras Churchyard in London, where just five months earlier she had walked down the aisle with William Godwin. The grave itself would play a significant part in the history of her daughter Mary Shelley as it is where she would later declare her love for the man whose surname she would take as her own in marriage, the poet and writer Percy Bysshe Shelley. Mary's mother's tombstone still stands in the churchyard today, in the part of the cemetery which remains after it was broken up to make way for the railroad tracks to St. Pancras Railway Station. William Godwin, Mary Shelley's father, struggled to raise his two daughters, Fanny being the eldest from his late wife's previous relationship, and Mary, the very young baby. So, with this in mind, he declared the need for another wife. Of course, the irony here is that, although agreeing and encouraging his late wife's thinking on the equality of the sexes, he was essentially looking for a woman to care for the children and keep house. When he did remarry, it was to Mary Jane Claremont, yet another Mary, but that's where the similarity ended. Young Mary soon found out that her stepmother was not a kind woman. She would frequently beat the child for speaking up for herself and engaging in adult conversation. Mary was so lively as a child that her father nicknamed her Mercury, and by the time she was 10, she had learned all of her mother's writings by heart. 
Just like the mother she had never known, Mary refused to conform or be subdued and constantly rebelled. She excelled in her lessons, looked to her father for favor and inspiration, and hated domestic pursuits. It's said that if asked to cook the dinner, she would just throw any old thing into the oven and let it burn to a crisp while she read an interesting book. The new family also included two extra children, the products of a previous relationship for the new Mrs. Godwin. Mary had acquired, along with her half-sister Fanny, a stepbrother called Charles and a stepsister called Claire. They all lived in Somerstown, an area of London directly adjacent to the British Library at St. Pancras and south of Camden Town. It had been developed by the rich landowner Lord Somers, hence the name, and had become something of a haven for aristocratic refugees fleeing from the murderous dangers of the French Revolution. Mary's mother was never far from her thoughts, and she would spend hours at her grave in the churchyard at St. Pancras, reading out loud to her tombstone. Usually this was to escape from the clutches of her stepmother whenever her father was unable to spend time with her. This was a habit that continued well into her teenage years. It's sad to think that the little girl actually learned how to write her own name by tracing the inscription on her mother's tombstone. Among her father's circle of intellectual friends that included famous essayists, poets, authors, journalists, and academic luminaries such as Charles Lamb, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and William Wordsworth, Mary grew into a strong and opinionated young woman and spent many hours debating and discussing philosophical issues with her father, William Godwin. One of the most famous devotees of William Godwin's work was a handsome young poet called Percy Bysshe Shelley, who spent a great deal of time at the family home in London. That Shelley inspired the young girl is certain. In fact, she was inspired by many of her father's literary circle and their famous friends. Here's a brief overview of some of the well-known faces that Mary would have come into contact with. It does go some way to explaining her early entry into the world of literature. Percy Bysshe Shelley is the most obvious first candidate, as in 1814, he would elope with Mary to Europe, traveling around Switzerland, Germany, and Italy. 
Shelley was born in 1792, and in 1822 he drowned in a sudden storm while sailing along the Italian coastline. He was 22 when he ran away with Mary, and she was just a month shy of her 17th birthday. He was married to Harriet Westbrook at the time, and he left her for Mary with the knowledge that she was expecting their second child. Mary declared her love for Percy Bishy Shelley at her mother's grave, with both of them believing, like Mary's mother and father before her, that the ties of the heart were more important than legal ones. But William Godwin had an unusually conventional reaction to the burgeoning love between Shelley and his daughter. He banned the young poet from his house, which was a counterproductive act that eventually drove his favorite daughter away from him. Shelley was one of the major English Romantic poets, considered to be among the finest lyric poets of the English language. He led an unconventional and notorious life, being expelled from Oxford University and demanding that Harriet, his first wife, share herself with his best friend Thomas Hogg in an open marriage. With a similar viewpoint, he also persuaded Mary's stepsister, Claire Claremont, to elope with them when he and Mary left England for Europe. He became the idol of future generations of English poets, including Robert Browning and Alfred Lord Tennyson. However, his two best-known contemporaries, both of whom he had great affection and friendship for, were John Keats and Lord Byron. Keats was a young poet, again of the English Romantic school, who would never see critical acclaim during his lifetime. He was born in 1795, but his life was cut tragically short in 1821 as a result of tuberculosis, a disease which had already claimed the lives of his mother and brother before him. Lord Byron, on the other hand, was, as goes the famous quote by his paramour, Lady Carolyn Lamb, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Born in 1778, he died young while he was fighting for a cause in Greece in 1824. But George Gordon Byron actually achieved greater fame because of his controversial exploits than from his literary writings. However, whichever way you look at it, Byron's lifestyle was extravagant with a capital E, consisting of numerous love affairs with both sexes, fathering illegitimate children wherever he went, incurring debts, committing incest, sodomy, and frankly just about every vice you can think of. He was labeled at the time as satanic and perverted, while his self-esteem was legendarily fragile due to a lame foot that forced him to walk with a slight limp. For this reason, any criticism, however slight, of himself or his poetry cut him to the quick. Like Mary Shelley, her husband Percy, and John Keats, Byron was afflicted by a great many tragedies in his short but eventful life. These poets of the English Romantic era concentrated on the inspiration of their surroundings, which included beautiful landscapes and the natural elements, all of which could be found in the countryside they all knew so well, and which still continues to inspire artists to this very day. From the dramatic mountains of the Lake District so beloved of Wordsworth and Coleridge, the highlands of Scotland, and the snow-capped peaks of Wales, to the rolling green and pleasant rural lands of yesteryear, this was an age of dramatic response to what was all around. And it was an environment in which Mary Shelley, because of her upbringing and circle of acquaintance, was well-versed. She also traveled further afield, experiencing even wilder landscapes, and much of the descriptive power of Frankenstein 
comes from the backdrop she created in which her characters play out their parts. The excursion she made to Chamonix in eastern France and the Mer de Glace, which means wall of ice in translation in the Chamonix Valley, really made an impression upon her. The Mer de Glace is an amazing sight to behold and Mary used it to great effect as an impressive natural backdrop for the early chapters in her Frankenstein novel. The elopement with Percy Bysshe Shelley was indeed scandalous, and the pair traveled around Europe for six weeks before returning home again. Mary used her journals and letters from that journey to emulate a piece of work done by her mother, publishing letters of a time spent in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. Young Mary's work was entitled, A History of a Six-Week Tour Through a Part of France, Switzerland, Germany, and Holland, with letters descriptive of a sail round the Lake of Geneva and of the glaciers of Chamonix. Not one of literature's catchiest titles, I'm sure you'll agree. But the idea for Frankenstein the novel did not come from these letters or Mary Shelley's illicit travels around Europe. It came from the darkest recesses of her imagination during the spring and summer of 1816. This was a very apt time for Mary Shelley to begin writing a dark and foreboding tale, as this was indeed a dark time, quite literally. 1816 was popularly referred to as the year without summer due to severe climate abnormalities. This was as a consequence of volcanic eruptions that emitted from Mount Tambora in Indonesia, which over a 10-day period poured some 2 million metric tons of dust into the upper atmosphere, allowing less sunlight to get through. It was this particular summer that the runaway couple, still unmarried, visited Lord Byron at the Villa Diodati by Lake Geneva in Switzerland. They had planned many outdoor activities, but due to the weather being so cold and the light being so dismal, they ended up spending most of the time sat around a roaring fire and reading each other ghost stories from Phantasmagoriana, a sinister German anthology. Lord Byron then challenged Mary and Percy, along with his personal physician, to each write a scarier ghost story than anything they'd heard, with the winner being the one judged to be the scariest. Mary, in her own words, admitted that she wanted to think of a story that would speak to the mysterious fears of human nature and awaken thrilling horror. In her view, it should make the reader dread to look around to curdle the blood and quicken the beating of the heart. You'd have to agree that in Frankenstein, the lady was indeed as good as her word. Mary's idea for Frankenstein came in what she called a waking dream, perhaps more of a nightmare experienced in the daytime. The only other participant in this bizarre competition to come up with anything was Lord Byron, who wrote a small fragment about some of the vampire legends he had heard while on his recent travels. But it was, of course, no contest for Mary's monster. What Mary had come up with was the perfect gothic horror novel. This sort of theme truly was very popular in the early 19th century, especially as the horror was amalgamated with romanticism. Frankenstein features a blend of romanticism, 
and gothic horror, which some critics say mirrors the philosophical tensions in the relationship between Mary, the would-be gothic writer, and her husband-to-be, the romantic poet Percy Bysshe Shelley. The Gothic novel is undoubtedly a precursor of what is now considered to be modern horror fiction. It gathered momentum with Bram Stoker's Dracula. Before Edgar Allan Poe bestowed such delicious darkness as The Pit and the Pendulum and The Raven upon an unsuspecting world. And of course, with the dark occult writing of Dennis Wheatley, and the inspired 20th century master of horror Stephen King, the genre, although dating well back into the 18th century, is alive and well, and as scary as ever. Although the female authors who went before Mary Shelley were pretty proficient in this ghastly genre, few male authors have come close to the true horror she created. Jane Austen, mentioned previously as a writer of beautifully romantic fiction, was also influenced by the Gothic style in her novel Northanger Abbey. The main theme of the novel explores the perils of young love when fueled by an overactive imagination fed by the Gothic novel. Jane Austen actually references several Gothic novels especially the works of Mrs. Radcliffe in her prose. So even though there are many parodies of Gothic novels now, with the emphasis focusing on comedy mixed rather liberally with horror, Miss Austen was evidently the first to parody horror in this way, with her delicious tongue-in-cheek approach. Frankenstein also made its mark in the male-dominated movie industry when it was filmed for Hollywood in 1931. Horror is still to this day a mainstay of the big studios, with many screenwriters still adapting original works like Frankenstein, Dracula, and The Raven for the big screen. New writers inspired by the gothic style of Mary Shelley and those who followed her also flourished in Hollywood with horror. For example, the writer of Psycho was inspired by Edgar Allan Poe, and Alfred Hitchcock, the legendary director of Psycho, also declared that Edgar Allan Poe had been a major inspiration. He even went so far as to say that the reason he started to make suspense movies was because he liked Poe's stories so much. And of course, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein had influenced Poe in his turn. So you could say that the horror movie industry owes a great deal to the imagination of this 19-year-old girl. Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus, to give Mary's novel its full title, was published in 1818, with a revised edition 13 years later in which Mary Shelley smoothed over some of the more controversial themes she'd initially hinted at. In the first edition, the reason that Victor Frankenstein created the monster is vice, whereas in the later edition, he invents the creature purely for scientific purposes. Also, suggestions of an incestuous relationship between Victor and Elizabeth in the earlier version, she being his biological sister, are revised in the later edition, when she is presented as the Frankenstein family's adopted daughter, making the story more acceptable. The subtitle, The Modern Prometheus, refers to a figure from Greek mythology, Prometheus, who created man which ties in very neatly with Victor Frankenstein's attempt to do the same thing. In Greek mythology, Prometheus also took fire from the heavens and gave it to man, which angered Zeus, the king of the Greek gods, and ends in the ultimate destruction of Prometheus. Uh. 
Victor Frankenstein creates life from nothing, rebelling against the laws of nature, for which he is punished by the monster he has created. The parallels are strong indeed, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here, so let's pause and take a closer look at the story of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in a little more detail. The novel begins with a series of letters from Robert Walton to his sister, Walton being an English Arctic explorer who spots a strange figure on a dog sled on the ice. This is none other than an exhausted Victor Frankenstein in pursuit of the monster he created, and while recuperating he tells his story. Born into a wealthy Geneva family, after the death of his mother, he became a student of natural philosophy and medicine. Inspired by occult philosophy and the teaching of his mentor, Waldman, he builds a creature in the semblance of a man. Life and death appeared to me ideal bounds which I should first break through and pour a torrent of light into our dark world. Frankenstein then uses all his knowledge to bring the monster to life. The body is assembled from parts that Victor has stolen from butcher shops and dissecting rooms, and by grave robbing. The shocking creature escapes and is repeatedly rejected by those who see it, but the monster proves intelligent and eventually highly articulate. Shunned everywhere it goes, the monster soon becomes embittered. You seek for knowledge and wisdom as I once did, and I ardently hope that the gratification of your wishes may not be a serpent to sting you, as mine has been. Victor leaves his creation for dead, and it disappears, but then he hears that William, his younger brother, has been strangled. Justine, a family servant, is found guilty of the murder and is hanged. But of course it was the monster that murdered William and destroyed Justine, and he later admits this to his creator. I have murdered the lovely and the helpless. I have strangled the innocent as they slept, and grasped to death his throat who never injured me or any other living thing. I have devoted my creator to misery. Victor then agrees to make a mate for the monster so that it will not bother anyone again. I am alone and miserable. Man will not associate with me, but one as deformed and horrible as myself would not deny herself to me. My companion must be of the same species and have the same defects. This being you must create. However, a wave of remorse makes Victor destroy the female monster just as she is being brought to life. The lonely creature swears revenge, and so kills Victor's bride, Elizabeth, on their wedding night. Victor is driven mad with grief, but recovers and pursues the creature across the world, which is when he is discovered on the Arctic wastes. Eventually, creator and creation meet for a final showdown. Victor Frankenstein dies in an attempt to kill the creature with his bare hands. The creature describes eloquently to Walton his efforts to seek out beauty and how crime has degraded it beneath the meanest animal. He is dead who called me into being, and when I shall be no more, the very remembrance of us both will speedily vanish. I shall no longer see the sun or stars or feel the wind play on my cheeks. Light feeling and sense will pass away, and in this condition must I find my happiness." The monster then leaps from the ship onto an ice raft, disappearing again in the darkness, leaving readers to decide his fate. In 
Frankenstein, there is no real clear-cut hero or villain. Both of the main characters are, in some respects, the extreme opposite of each other, very much as Robert Louis Stevenson would later explore in his famous novel, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The larger theme is, of course, the elemental battle between good and evil in every individual. Victor Frankenstein is the alter ego of his monstrous creation, which is never given a name, apart from descriptions like the creature, the wretch, the abortion, or the fiend. It has even been argued that the creature is nothing more than a figment of Victor's fertile imagination, and that he alone committed the vile murders of his best friend, brother, and wife, his monster a mere invented device to be the scapegoat. Now, having seen pictures of the extremely feminine-looking Mary Shelley, you can't help wondering how she came up with this gruesome horror. Surely it had to be something more than an old ghost story and trying to win a competition on a holiday when the weather was bad. Many people believe Frankenstein was Mary Shelley's way of pouring out the stress of the many tragic events that had blighted her young life, starting with the death of her own mother Her birth had resulted in her mother's death, which very possibly left Mary feeling terribly guilty. Then in the same dark year that she wrote Frankenstein as a short story, she returned home to England when news reached her abroad that Fanny, her half-sister, had committed suicide. And shortly after that tragedy, Percy Bishy Shelley's wife Harriet drowned herself in the Serpentine in London. The Serpentine is the large lake that divides Hyde Park and Kensington Gardens, created in 1730 by the damming of a small portion of the River Thames, which Mary Wollstonecraft had tried to drown herself in years earlier. This unfortunate event weighed heavily on Mary's conscience, because she felt responsible for taking Percy Bysshe Shelley away from the poor woman in the first place. Nevertheless, Mary married Percy soon afterwards in order to try and gain custody of Percy's children by Harriet, but they were eventually refused. Before her marriage to poet Percy Bysshe Shelley, despite the fact that she had grown up without ever even knowing her mother, Mary always referred to herself as Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin. After her marriage, she dropped the Godwin, but hung on to her mother's name signing her letters MWS. Sadly, there was no happy ending to this saga, as in the next few years, two of her own children died in infancy. The first, Clara, was born and died in 1818, just before Mary's novel was published. The infant had been born prematurely and died very quickly. Likewise, her son William died the very next year of malaria. Mary also suffered several miscarriages, one of which very nearly killed her, and her own desire to bring the dead back to life must have been overwhelming. Mary's one surviving son was born in 1819 and was christened Percy Florence, named after his father and the beautiful city in Italy where he was born.
But her joy with the little boy was short-lived. For his father, Percy Bishy Shelley, died in a terrible accident, a shipwreck during a sudden storm while sailing. This was in 1822, just after she'd suffered yet another miscarriage with serious effects on her health. Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley returned to England and spent the remainder of her life bringing up her son and trying to find a publisher for a book of Percy Bysshe Shelley's unpublished poetry. When his grandfather, Sir Timothy Shelley, died in 1844, he left his large estate to young Percy as the only living male heir. Percy, with his wife Jane and his mother Mary, moved into Field Place in Sussex in 1849. But it seemed as if as soon as Mary knew her son was financially secure, she lost the will to live. During the next two years, she would suffer panic attacks and psychosomatic illnesses before dying of a mysterious paralysis in her sleep on the 1st of February, 1851, in London. Many people believe from the symptoms that it was an undetected brain tumor, and this could explain her steady deterioration. Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley was buried in Bournemouth on England's south coast. The depleted Shelley family had a home in Bournemouth, as well as the London townhouse where Mary died because it had been hoped the author of Frankenstein could have lived out her days in peace at the seaside. Percy exhumed the bodies of his grandparents, Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin, who had died in 1843, to place them beside their daughter in a family tomb. In another 40 years time, he and his wife Jane would join them to conclude this tragic saga. However, mentioning the Shelley's London abode does give their story a marvelous postscript. This is 24 Chester Square, London, which has only in more recent years been adorned with the blue plaque that commemorates Mary Shelley's time here from 1846 until her death in 1851. Far from being an oversight on the part of historic plaque erectors, it was, in fact, as a direct result of the enduring fear that Frankenstein can create, even in the 21st century. The owners of the house, when the idea was first suggested, were truly horrified at having the words, author of Frankenstein, displayed on the wall of their home and refused to allow it to be put up. Fortunately for Mary Shelley fans, the house changed hands, and on October the 7th, 2003, the lady's achievements were finally commemorated. This makes it much easier for anyone on a pilgrimage to the locations associated with the creator of Frankenstein to find the house. Mary Shelley's legacy lives on. Frankenstein is a universally recognized story all over the world. First published anonymously because of the prejudice against women writers at the time. Her own contribution to literature is immeasurable. And Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley also paved the way for other female novel writers to follow, including Emily Bronte, and her own foul but irresistible creation, Heathcliff, in Wuthering Heights. 
However, there is no denying that Mary's own life story would be perceived to be as horrific as her novel by modern-day psychologists trying to analyze her character. But perhaps, writing her darkest thoughts on the pages of Frankenstein helped her to cope a little better with all that fate threw her way. Maybe this is the essence of why both Frankenstein and the monster remain truly captivating. Mary Shelley wrote of what she knew firsthand, even if it was in a context far, far removed from the actual world in which she lived. <laughs> 